Okay, hello guys, welcome back. I hope you're all keeping safe and that you're all having a productive isolation period. Um, today I'm going to go through the talk through for chapter three of the sign of four in quest of a solution. Um, I'm going to do it exactly the same way that I did for chapter two. So I'm going to read each page and then I'm going to talk through some of my annotation and some of the big ideas that this chapter kind of explores. Um, just to remind you, same as with chapter two, we have here the numbers. So again, this is the, the breakdown. Oops, that's a bit too much. The breakdown of the chapter. So you can make sure to be noting these numbers as we go through. As I said last time, these numbers uh, and these sections will really, really help us when we come to actually preparing for the exam. Okay, so, um, so chapter three we're going to see the journey of Watson and Holmes and Morstan to this mysterious gentleman. Remember the guy from chapter two who had been sending them the pearls, who said that they knew something about the disappearance of Mary's father, um, who said that Mary was a wronged woman. They're going to be on their way to meet that guy. So on that journey, we'll get a little bit of Holmes as a detective, we see some more of his skills. We're going to get a little bit of Watson's impressions of London, uh, particularly the murky, darker side of London. Uh, we're going to get some of Watson's opinions on class. And alongside that, we're going to see a little bit of development of the relationship between Mary Morstan and Watson. OK, let's get started. So chapter three. Here we go. It was half past five before Holmes returned. He was bright, eager and in excellent spirits, a mood in which his case alternated with fits of the blackest depression. There was no great mystery in this matter, he said, taking the cup of tea which I had poured out for him. The facts appear to admit of only one explanation. What? You have solved it already? Well, that would be too much to say. I have discovered a suggestive fact, that is all. It is, however, very suggestive. The details are still to be added. I have just found, on consulting the back files of the Times, that Major Sholto of Upper Norwood, late of the 34th Bombay Infantry, died upon the 28th of April, 1882. I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see what this suggests. No. You surprise me. Look at it in this way, then. Captain Mawson disappears. The only person in London whom he could have visited is Major Sholto. Major Sholto denies having heard that he was in London. Four years later, Sholto dies. Within a week of his death, Captain Morstan's daughter receives a valuable present, which is repeated from year to year and now culminates in a letter which describes her as a wronged woman. What wrong can it refer to except this deprivation of her father? And why should the presents begin immediately after Sholto's death, unless it was Sholto's heir knows something of the mystery and desires to make compensation? OK, let's, let's stop there. So um, right at the beginning of the chapter, we get an, a, an additional description of Holmes, you know, comparing this to chapter one, his uh, depressions, his black moods. We now see that Holmes is bright and eager and in excellent spirits. So this would suggest that Holmes is invigorated by the case that he is now um, that he is now caught up in the passion of the case, that, that he's just generally, you know, very excited, uh, which alternated Watson observes with fits of the blackest depression. So again, this, this shows that Holmes, when not on the case, is a very depressed, morose sort of character. Interestingly, and this is something that I will return to throughout this novel, we're kind of given a bit of light, dark imagery about Holmes here. You know, he's said to be bright, bright to mean happy, lights up the room uh, but at the same time have the bits of the blackest depression so we see Holmes described in light and dark ways uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we move on um Holmes believes the facts appear to admit of only one explanation so he's worked out who they're going to see already he, he understands it he's worked it out and he is correct like the person that they're going to see is the son of Major Sholto um here we're given a clue, a clue that the, this Major Sholto of Upper Norwood is dead. So the Major Sholto that Mary Morstan talks about in Chapter 2, that she talks about going to see for information about her father, he's now dead. And soon after his death, 
she starts to receive these gifts. Just alongside this, you know, we, we have reference to the Bombay Infantry, so that, that evokes you know, India, Empire, colonialization, all that kind of stuff, um, which will factor into the novel later on. Uh, but, but also talks a little bit about the relationship between between Major Shelter and Captain Morse. You know, they, they were friends in India, so they were away from England when they were kind of communicating. Um, and here, this is Holmes going through his working out as to why he thinks that they're going to see possibly the son of Major Sholto. You know, uh, yeah, it's basically everything that I just said. So, yeah, that's page one. Let's move on. So, have you any alternative theory which will meet the facts? But what a strange compensation and how strangely made. Why, too, should he write a letter now rather than six years ago? Again, the letter speaks of giving her justice. What justice can she have? It is too much to suppose that her father is still alive. There is no other injustice in her case that you know of. There are difficulties. There are certainly difficulties, said Sherlock Holmes pensively. But our expedition of tonight will solve them all. Ah, here is a four-wheeler, and Miss Mawson is inside. Are you all ready? Then we had better go down, for it is a little past the hour. I picked up my hat and my heaviest stick, but I observed that Holmes took his revolver from his drawer and slipped it into his pocket. It was clear that he thought that our night's work might be a serious one. Miss Molston was muffled in a dark cloak and her sensitive face was composed but pale. She must have been more than woman if she did not feel some uneasiness at the strange enterprise upon which we were embarking. Yet her self-control was perfect, and she readily answered the few additional questions which Sherlock Holmes put to her. Major Sholto was a very particular friend of Papa's, she said. His letters were full of allusions to the Major. He and Papa were in command of the troops at the Andaman Islands, so they were thrown a great deal together. By the way, a curious paper was found in Papa's desk, which no one could understand. I don't suppose that it is of the slightest importance, but I thought that you might care to see it, so I brought it with me. It is here. Okay, so here we have a reference to one of the big themes in this book justice so Holmes is saying here that the letter speaks of giving her oh sorry Watson is saying here that the letter speaks of giving her justice and he asks the question what justice can she have and <clears throat> this is a big thing that could easily come up on a test so when dealing, looking at Mary Morstan there are a few types of justice that she could maybe be seen as entitled to the first the most obvious would be legal justice you know who is responsible for the death of her father or who knows how or why he died you know at this point we assume that he is dead um so those people could be brought to justice they could be seen to be punished or they could receive um prison or something like that the second might be financial justice you know, Mary Morstan is entitled to half of the treasure from this novel. So the money that she would receive would be justice for all of these years that she has essentially been the heiress to a fortune, but been living as a governess. Which takes me neatly on to the third type of justice, social justice. You know, Mary Morstan, aside from all of the treasure, is the daughter of someone who served in the army. You know, she should be higher up the social order than a governess in someone's house, possibly looked after, possibly um, working in a more philanthropic way, you know, working with charity and that kind of thing. But but definitely social justice. You know, at the minute, Mary Morstan is maybe lower middle class. I'd say that Captain Morstan is probably middle middle class. So so, yeah, she could be moving up that justice, uh, that social ladder a little bit more. Next, a little bit more on Sherlock Holmes. You know, um, he describes the the going and meeting this person as an expedition, which would mean an adventure into an unknown place. You know, the to Holmes, this is exciting. It is um, a possibility for discovery, even as an expedition would be. But at the same time. Expedition also links with the idea of colonialism and, and most certainly to the Victorians, the idea of the first people that went into these countries that they eventually colonised and turned into part of the British Empire, 
they would have seen those journeys as expeditions. Um, and although, you know, that doesn't necessarily link with what we're looking at here, you know, the, 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 this doesn't link with colonialism. I think it's important to note that, that this is definitely the language of colonialism and it's seamlessly included in Sherlock Holmes' vocabulary, you know. Um, he could have said our adventure or he could have said um, our journey, but, but no, he uses the word expedition. So we have the four wheeler, you know, horse and cart, just for those who don't know. Uh, and, and again, on Holmes and Watson, the fact that Watson leaves the house with his heaviest stick and Holmes leaves the house with a revolver. This shows that Holmes and Watson are ready for violence. They're willing to defend themselves or protect Mary Morstan, you know. Um, at the same time, it might insinuate that they're going to maybe a more disreputable part of London. You know, they're going to a part of London where it's going to be rough, where they're potentially going to be getting into a fight. You know, they don't know. We're moving on. So next we have some nice descriptions of Mary Morstan. So she was muffled in a dark cloak. Her sensitive face was composed, but pale. And again, you know, thinking about what we talked about with Holmes at the beginning of the chapter, here we have Mary Morstan presented as in a dark cloak, but with a pale face. So using some of that light, dark imagery to describe her also, remembering the idea that this book deals with dualities of character. So looking at people that have two sides to them, as Holmes does, you know, when Holmes isn't on a case, he's morose, he's depressed, he has black moods. When Holmes is on a case, he's excited, he's invigorated, he is energetic. Uh, Mary Morstan, more complex at the minute. We haven't read too much about her, so we don't quite yet know what these two sides might be, but definitely there's a hint at that. Um, the darkness of her cloak, to reiterate, it could link with mourning, you know, the that she's mourning the disappearance of her father. Uh, and the paleness of her face could indicate fear or worry. Zoom back in. Um, now, now, remember what I said about Mary Morstan in chapter two, her being a representative of a typical Victorian society. Here we see it again. Her self-control was perfect. She's not revealing any emotion. She's not giving anything away. Even though this is a really serious thing for her, her father's disappeared. She's got no idea where he went. She's received a note from a random stranger saying that they're going to tell them something about the disappearance of her father. This is a really big night for her, but she maintains her self-control. You know, this is a very Victorian attitude. You keep your emotions within. Um, and then we just have some more information about the case. Moving on. So Holmes, sorry, that's it. There we go. Holmes unfolded the paper carefully and smoothed it out upon his knee. He then very methodically examined it all over with his double lens. It is a paper of native Indian manufacture, he remarked. It has at some time been pinned to a board. The diagram upon it appears to be a plan of part of a large building with numerous halls, corridors and passages. At one point is a small cross done in red ink, and above it is 3.37 from left, in faded pencil writing. In the left-hand corner is a curious hieroglyphic, like four crosses in line with their arms touching. Beside it is written, in very rough and coarse characters, the sign of four, Jonathan Small, Mahomet Singh, Abdullah Khan, Dost Akbar. No, I confess that I do not see how this bears upon the matter, yet it is evidently a document of importance. It has been kept carefully in a pocketbook, for the one side is as clean as the other. It was in his pocketbook that we found it. Preserve it carefully then, Miss Morstan, for it may prove to be of use to us. I begin to suspect that this matter may turn out to be much deeper and more subtle than I at first suppose. I must reconsider my ideas. He leaned back in the cab. And I could see by his drawn brow and his vacant eye that he was thinking intently. Miss Morstan and I chatted in an undertone about our present expedition and its possible outcome, but our companion maintained his impenetrable reserve until the end of our journey. Now I'm going to stop there. I'll, I'll read this paragraph and then we'll move on. Okay, so um, here we have some of Holmes's detective skills. You know, he uh, uses a, a 
magnifying glass, he's able to identify the manufacturer of the paper, all this kind of stuff it links with Holmes being a detective. Now, here we have the very first mention of the sign of four, you know, the title of the book. So this should pique the interest of any reader, not necessarily just Victorian readers. Um, so first we have the symbol that is on there. You know, the, there is possibly some symbolism within this. The, the four crosses in a line with their arms touching. You know, this maybe hints that there is some connection between these four people. But the really, the really interesting thing is, is the names of the people involved. So we have Jonathan Small, Mahomet Singh, Abdullah Khan and Dost Akbar. Now here we have a name that stands out pretty obviously. Jonathan Small, very white British name. Mahomet Singh, Abdullah Khan, Dost Akbar, um, Indian names. So this would be particularly interesting to a Victorian audience because here we see a white British person potentially in cahoots with three what would be considered um, indigenous native people. Now one thing that the Victorians weren't really into was the idea of collaborating, working alongside indigenous peoples for everybody's benefit. It was a lot about exploitation. Um, as we'll get on to, you know, when we, when we do start talking about the, the India Rebellion, as we will when we get to chapter 12. But, but definitely there would have been a worry that native indigenous people could manipulate or influence or control white British people. Uh, and this, this all links with the concept of Victorian fear, as we will discuss again later on. But, but one of the biggest worries for Victorian society were that the colonies and the people living in the colonies would rise up and somehow overthrow the white British rulers. So this very much, these four names very much would speak to a Victorian audience. And we're, con we're now very curious about who this Jonathan Small is. Um, in addition, you know, if a Victorian reader were to see those names and think that Jonathan Small was working with them, then they may consider that treason. Um, so I, I begin to suspect this matter may turn out to be much deeper and more subtle than I at first supposed. That develops the idea of mystery that even Holmes is now struggling with this case. Um, so, and then we get Holmes thinking. And, and, and I like this. This is a nice, a nice metaphor uh, for showing Holmes having a big think. Uh, our companion maintained his impenetrable reserve. So the idea of his thinking is, oh, sorry, that his reserve is impenetrable, meaning that nothing can get through to Holmes while he is thinking. This shows that he is very focused, that he is able to concentrate on one specific detail for a very long time but at the same time you know the word impenetrable it talks oh, i didn't do that it talks of things like castles large brick buildings um prisons places that you either can't get in or you can't get out uh, and, and I, I think that that kind of that kind of characterizes Holmes's thinking processes, really. Watson can't get in there, and Holmes can't really get his own thoughts out to Watson. You know, they do struggle with communication sometimes. Okay, now, now the next bit, we're given a setting, uh, the description of the setting. We're shown Watson's view of London. Uh, it certainly is tinged with some romanticism, as Holmes criticizes him for, but but. Yeah, let's, let's read through it. Okay. It was a September evening, and not yet seven o'clock, but the day had been a dreary one, and a dense, drizzly fog lay low upon the great city. Mud-coloured clouds drooped sadly over the muddy streets. Down the strand, the lamps were but misty splotches of diffused light, which threw a... Sorry a second. Which threw a feeble, circular glimmer upon the slimy pavement. The yellow glare from the shop windows streamed out into the steamy, vaporous air and threw a murky, shifty radiance across the crowded thoroughfare. There was to my mind something eerie and ghost-like in the endless procession of faces which flitted across these narrow bars of light, sad faces and glad, haggard and merry. Like all humankind, they flitted from the gloom into the light and so back into the gloom once more. 
I am not subject to impressions, but a dull, heavy evening with the strange business upon which we were engaged combined to make me nervous and depressed. I could see from Miss Morstan's manner that she was suffering from the same feeling. Holmes alone could rise superior to petty influences. He held his open notebook upon his knee, and from time to time he jotted down figures and memoranda in the light of his pocket lantern. At the Lyceum Theatre, the crowds were already thick at the side entrances. In front, a continuous stream of hansoms and four-wheelers were rattling up, discharging their cargoes of shirt-fronted men and beshawled, bediamonded women. We had hardly reached the third pillar, which was our rendezvous, before a small, dark, brisk man in the dress of a coachman accosted us. Are you the parties who come with Miss Morstan? he asked. I am Miss Morstan, and these two gentlemen are my friends, she said. He bent a pair of wonderfully penetrating and questioning eyes upon us. You'll excuse me, miss, he said, with a certain dogged manner, but I was to ask you to give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer. Okay. So, um, right, let's, before we begin, before we begin, let's just talk a little bit about light dark imagery. I know that we have talked about it before in class, but let's really just cover the idea that, you know, light represents good in many, many different ways and dark representing bad again in many, many different ways. Um, I, Conan Doyle utilizes light dark imagery really effectively in this, this part of the chapter. Um, but we need to think about what does it show about London and consider this that, you know, Watson's view is that the light is struggling to get through. So what might that say about the struggle between good and bad within the people of London, uh, within society as a whole at that time? Okay, uh, but you know, just to also clarify, you know, Watson is somewhat of an unreliable narrator. He does include a lot of his own biases, a lot of his own opinions, all that kind of stuff. So, so we really have to look at this description of London through the lens of Watson's overly romantic character. So it starts with dreary, dense, drizzly fog. You know, please make a note. We've got the du du du, so the use of plosives. So this might indicate a heaviness in the scene. I don't think Watson is angry about what he's looking at, but I, I think that he feels that it is heavy and it is depressing and it does weigh upon his soul the sight of London. Um, the, the miserable weather, we've got to talk about, you know, pathetic fallacy. We should all know what that is, using weather to foreshadow that things aren't going to be good. So we have some pathetic fallacy within there. Uh, also, you know, a little bit of personification of the weather. The dense drizzly fog lay low upon the great city. So that the fog, it was like the fog was lying on the city. It was so heavy. The city was being squashed by the frog, by the fog. Sorry, not the frog, the fog. Um, the mud colored clouds drooped sadly over the muddy streets. You know, the, the, the clouds, even the clouds are sad. And it, yeah, that could be a clever metaphor to say that it was raining, you know, if, if they're drooping sadly, then that might be their raindrops. But at the same time, you know, I think he's talking about the general effect of the scene is quite a depressing one. Now, now here, some good, good light dark imagery. The lamps were but misty splotches of diffused light. Diffused light. So this is that the darkness is kind of winning and the light is just slowly diffusing into the darkness and disappearing. So this is what I'm talking about when we talk about like the the light and the dark struggling against one another. Why is it doing this thing? It's doing this thing. You will just have to bear with me, guys. I'm very sorry about this. Um, there we go. Let's open that page again. For some reason, it won't switch between 20 and 21. I don't know why. Um, so then, the feeble circular glimmer. This feeble showing that the light was weak. The goodness was weak within London. Um, it, you know also struggling to get through at uh, the slimy pavement now i haven't talked about it yet but you know the pollution this london was towards the end of the victorian era dealing with a lot of the consequences of the industrial revolution a lot of smog a lot of fog a lot of pollution knocking about so the slimy pavement that that talks i think very much about the, the kind of the state of london in terms of pollution uh, and again smog with the steamy, vaporous air that threw a murky, shifting radiance across the crowded thoroughfare. So crowded, we, we, we've got to think a little bit about how, um, about how London was overcrowded too. 
you know, post-industrial revolution, a lot of people moved from the fields into the cities, causing London to become very, very cramped. So the crowded thoroughfares, so the crowded streets, there were too many people living there. There was to my mind something eerie and ghost-like, this nice simile, that, that he sees the people, but it's like they're not real. It's like they're shades of themselves. Um, and, you know, this, this might talk of Watson not knowing any of these people, but, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the endless procession of faces which flitted across these narrow bars of light, sad faces and glad, haggard and merry. So again, we have light, dark imagery. We have the faces which are moving between light patches and dark patches and light patches and dark patches. And Watson even spells it out here. Like all humankind, they flitted from the gloom into the light and so back into the gloom once more. So he believes that everyone in life is moving from these dark phases into these light phases and back into these dark phases. We see it with Holmes, you know, he starts the, the novel off in a dark phase and he's moved into a light phase now. We'll see it with Watson and Mary Morstan, you know, right now Watson is in a bit of a dark phase, but as his relationship with Mary Morstan develops, he moves into a light phase. I mean, all of this is subject to interpretation. Uh, all of this, I believe, shows Watson's bias and romantic attitude you know it's quite a quite a romantic idea to have but but definitely i think that this shows that at the very simplest level he believes that everyone has the capacity for good and bad again developing that idea that there is a duality within people and, and we've got a little bit of irony here you know he says i'm not subject to impressions well, obviously he is but obviously he is because he's just given us a really impressionistic description of London. So Watson maybe wants to be quite a hard-headed Victorian gentleman, but in reality he's a bit of a bit of a dandy really, I think. However, Holmes absolutely not. You know, you could use that, you could definitely use that as the difference between Holmes and Watson if that question comes up. You know, Watson's very romantic, but Holmes alone could rise superior to petty influences. So Holmes is not influenced by his surroundings. He's not influenced by the things that he sees and hears and does. He's just this single-minded, calculating machine who is just going to get the case done, get to the end, work it all out. He doesn't believe in romanticism. Which, interesting, as we get through and we look more into the difference between Holmes and Watson, we'll need to start to think about why are they so different and why does it work that they are so different? Okay, so here a little bit about class. We've got shirt-fronted men, be shawled, be diamonded women. We are dealing with upper class people here, upper class people. But then we switch to a small, dark, brisk man in the dress of the coach, in the dress of a coachman. And um, this adds to the mystery. This person does not belong in this crowd, or unless it is in the the role of taxi driver. But um, but definitely, we have a little bit of a change of focus there. Uh, Watson enjoys the mystery so far, you know, he believes the man has wonderfully penetrating eyes, all of those kinds of things. Now that the final sentence on this page is, is an important one. The fact that he says, neither of your companions is a police officer. You must give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer. This shows the, a general distrust of police by Thaddeus Sholto, who is the person they're going to see, and his associate. But at the same time, it develops the idea that the Victorian people didn't trust the police. Um, and, and again, as we see more of this, uh, particularly in the next chapter, when Sholto is talking about the police, we will see even greater how much the Victorians distrusted the police force. Okay. I give you my word on that, she answered. He gave a shrill whistle on which a street Arab led across a four-wheeler and opened the door. The man who had addressed us mounted to the box while we took our places inside. We'd hardly done so before the driver whipped up his horse and we plunged away at a furious pace through the foggy streets. The situation was a curious one. We were driving to an unknown place on an unknown errand, yet our invitation was either a complete hoax, which was an inconceivable hypothesis, or else we had good reason to think that the important issues might hang upon our journey. Miss Morrison's demeanour was as resolute and collected as ever. 
I endeavoured to cheer and amuse her by reminiscences, reminiscences of my adventures in Afghanistan, but to tell the truth, I was myself so excited at our situation and so curious as to our destination that my stories were slightly involved. To this day, she declares that I told her one moving anecdote as to how a musket looked into my tent at the dead of the night and how I fired a double barrel tiger cub at it. At first, I had some idea as to the direction in which we were driving, but soon, what with our pace, the fog, and my own limited knowledge of London, I lost my bearings and knew nothing, save that we seemed to be going a very long way. Sherlock Holmes was never at fault, however, and he muttered the names as the cab rattled through squares and in and out of torturous by-streets. Rochester Row, he said. Now Vincent Square. Now we come out on the Vauxhall Bridge. We are making for the Surrey side, apparently. Yes, I thought so. Now we are on the bridge. You can catch glimpses of the river. Okay, I'm um, just going through this really quick. Cause this is not a great deal. Um, so the first thing, uh, this needs changing. I have done a little wrong thing up here. Where Watson talks about a street Arab. Now, you know, obviously that has some racial and colonial overtones. But actually, in the Victorian era, street Arab was slang for an orphan child or a very 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 poor child that would be hanging about on the streets there to help people with with things uh, or rob them um we will come across that term again later in the novel but but just make that correction that this not necessarily it's not overtly racist it's kind of just a little uh, a little reference to children of the underclass shall we say um, so the way that Watson describes this, we plunged away at a furious pace through the foggy streets. This creates a sense of urgency, uh, develops the mystery. Um, again, mystery is developed by them going to an unknown place on an unknown errand that, that they don't know what they're actually doing yet. Uh, and again, we, we, we have this idea that Miss Morstan is a typical Victorian woman. Her demeanour was as resolute and collected as ever. You know, the, the idea that she was calm in all of this in all of these strange mysterious times um now now here we go Here, here's a good narrative device so watson obviously is talking about the past when he's writing this book you know, all the events of this book have already happened so he's writing it in the past however he includes to this day talking about the present so this shows us that in the present, Watson still knows Mary Morstan, which foreshadows their relationship developments. You know, even if they're not married or in an actual relationship, they at least are still in communication. This adds weight to their interactions. Um, I think this in some way negates Watson's unreliable narrator stuff. You know, all of the ways that he interprets Mary Morstan's behaviour in this novel could be read as kind of over elaborated um wishful thinking by a man who fancies someone who isn't really reciprocated but with this little reference to this day she declares that i told her this story shows us that actually watson was pretty pretty on the nail uh, and then watson you know he gets his his anecdotes mixed up he mixes up his anecdotes it shows that you know he's nervous that he um is excited uh, but also that he really wants to impress Mary Morstan, you know, let's just take a moment that if we unravel this anecdote, essentially what he's telling is the story of how he murdered a tiger cub. Uh, I think that this shows very different attitudes of women in the Victorian era to women today, because I'm not sure that many people would be persuaded to enter a relationship if their partner opens with a story about how they murdered an innocent cub. You know, bear in mind, it's not a full tiger. It's not a scary full tiger a little tiger cub um okay so then we also have reference again to the fog uh, and further we see sherlock holmes detective skills now i haven't written this down but i want you to note this when sherlock holmes is gathering evidence or doing detective stuff he tends to talk in very simple sentences you know, sometimes holmes can bang on a lot but when he's noting things down he's very concise very to the point nothing is very is, is confusing in what he says uh, and we see that here so now vincent square now we come on to the Vauxhall bridge we are making for the surrey side all of these are very short concise sentences 
One sec. Oh, it's done it again. You already just have to bear with me again. Sorry, guys. Sorry, 22. Okay. We did indeed get a fleeting view of the stretch of the Thames, with the lamps shining upon the broad, silent water, but our cab dashed on, and was soon involved in a labyrinth of streets upon the other side. Wordsworth Road, said my companion, Friary Road, Larkwall Lane, Stockwell Place, Robert Street, Cold Harbour Lane. Our quest does not appear to take us to very fashionable regions. We had indeed reached a questionable and forbidding neighbourhood. Long lines of dull brick houses were only relieved by the coarse glare and tawdry brilliance of public houses at the corner. Then came rows of two-storied villas, each with a fronting of miniature garden, and then again interminable lines of new staring brick buildings. The monster tentacles which the giant city was throwing out into the country. At last, the cab drew up at the third house in a new terrace. None of the other houses were inhabited, and, and that at which we stopped was as dark as its neighbours, save for a single glimmer in the kitchen window. On our knocking, however, the door was instantly thrown open by a Hindu servant clad in a yellow turban, white loose-fitting clothes, and a yellow sash. There was something strangely incongruous in this oriental figure framed in the commonplace doorway of a third-rate suburban dwelling house. "'There's a hib awaits you,' said he. And even as he spoke, there came a high piping voice from some inner room. "'Show them into me, Kip Magar! it cried. "'Show them straight into me!' So, just to finish Watson's descriptions of London, we get here some references to working class areas. Um, the, the labyrinth of streets, you know, the, the, these new streets being developed on the outskirts of London are like a maze. Um, and in fact, this word labyrinth is used quite often to describe sort of big places uh, and there are some connotations behind the word labyrinth you know the we could think back to the greeks and the minotaur in the labyrinth you know the 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 kind of the scary monster at the center of the labyrinth that's going to get you uh, we'll we'll see more about the potential candidates for that minotaur as we get through the story um, we had indeed reached a questionable and forbidding neighborhood so this is class now they're in a lower class neighborhood uh, the, the idea that it is forbidding that Watson and Holmes are not going to be welcome there. You know, the people from the upper and middle classes are not welcome in the lower class neighbourhoods. Uh, he describes the houses as dull. Um, again, thinking about Watson as maybe an aesthetic, someone that appreciates the beauty of things. He sees these new houses, you know, the, the kind of houses that would be like terraced houses, he sees them as dull boring not very pleasant to look at that, that he believes that they may be tarnish the reputation of london um and, and here we have a reference to pubs so the public houses he talks about the coarse glare the the idea that the, that the pubs are glaring at the people passing by and the coarse glare the the the, the look of the pubs is somehow um not necessarily painful but rough you know, uh, and the tawdry brilliancy. So, so here we have a nice oxymoron, tawdry brilliancy. So tawdry being something that is a uh, kind of um, unclassy, but brilliancy being that they were very showy. Now, this is a really nice metaphor. The monster tentacles which the giant city was throwing out into the country. So he sees these new projects, these new housing projects, as monster tentacles, like those of an octopus, reaching out and grasping into the countryside around London, breaking it, destroying it, getting rid of that land to house the overpopulated city, you know. Um, and, and here he personifies London as a giant city, throwing out these tentacles. That is the city itself that is throwing the tentacles out to the country. Um, finally, then, we get another use of little light dark imagery. So all of the houses were dark except from a single glimmer within this one house. So all the other houses are dark, all the other houses are bad. But this one house where they're going to, there is one glimmer of light, one glimmer of goodness and hope 
within this house. You know, and indeed, this is the house of Thaddeus Sholto, and Mary Morse is going to get a lot of information here. So, so we have the light dark imagery again. Um, the Hindu servant, another tour, uh, another reference to colonialism and empire. You know, this would have been somebody that would have been brought back from a country uh, like India. Uh, and the yellow turban. And there's a lot of symbolism within yellow in this novel, and we're going to see yellow thrown up again and again and again. Now, yellow that may reference wealth or happiness or goodness but at the same time possible links with illness maybe but but in this instance you know they're following a man with a yellow turban down a corridor to meet Thaddeus Sholto I think in this instance the yellow turban definitely definitely links with the idea of wealth um white loose fitting clothes so peace calm um well, yeah, you know, I wouldn't say innocence, but definitely this is a safe place, safe place. And again, we have the, the use of yellow again there, the yellow sash. So, so we have the sleeper awaits you, Kit Magar, Hindu servant, all of this kind of stuff. This is kind of the introduction to colonialism within this novel, uh, an introduction to the colonialist ideas definitely within this novel. Um, and, you know, write this question in your books there's going to be questions across my annotation and this could be a really nice revision exercise consider the contrasting descriptions of location what do they say about Watson's view of class think about how he describes the Lyceum you know the bediamonded women all of that kind of stuff and then how he describes this setting you know and then think a little bit about which class do you think that Watson would be most happy in? Okay, guys, I think that does it for this video. So I will upload chapter four as soon as I have it done.